It is October the 15th, 2021, and you're listening to Curiously Polar. I like our little music in the beginning. It's actually a, it's actually a piece made by my brother. He's really <laughs> it's a, good. It's a family business here. Mario, how are you doing? Hey, buddy. buddy. I'm doing really fine. Thank you, Chris. And uh, I'm really sorry that Henry couldn't join us today. Yeah, he's but, not uh, here. He's yeah, not here. Yeah. We miss him so much. But yeah. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> we'll we'll the two of us will manage. Just the two of us. Yes, and, and uh, plus it, of course, he has uh, to have take a. We have to give him credits because uh, he uh, actually contributed quite a with quite a lot of nice uh, heads up for the. Newsreel. Yes, we have a newsreel episode today. Just the newsreel, but hey, there's a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, and uh, yeah, Henry, hang in there. I know you're really busy, so um, we'll we'll have him back sooner or later. The newsreel. We have an entire episode just news topics. Isn't that isn't uh, isn't that amazing that the the whole Arctic Antarctic affairs um, create that much news? I've uh, I, I think it's good that things are being discussed in in public. It is good, uh, and uh, I agree that it it seems uh, like uh, it's taking a lot of space in the media. Yes. But uh, but it is something extremely important, and the Arctic and the Antarctic are the polar areas are areas where you see the effects of climate change yes. dramatically, and also like when you think think about something like uh, like uh, sea level rise, uh, the Arctic and especially the Antarctic are the global players for <laughs> for a sea level rise in case. Uh, a lot of the ice goes into uh, into the sea, and uh, the ice that is on land. So but uh, this episode is not just about the sea level rise and the climate. No. Uh, there are other things there as well. Let's just kick it off right from the start. We have, ho hold on, hold on, we have 11 items to cover here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Russia aims for uh, the North Sea route. How about that? Yeah. Who Who would have thought that they would do that? Yeah, well, it's not surprising, is it? It's it's not surprising, and uh, they have been having a North Sea route for internal transport. Or a transport Northern in. Sea route. I think the as a Northern German, sea when route. you say North Sea, you mean a different uh, yes. body of water. But it's the Northern Sea route through the Arctic. Yes, and uh, and if you if you look at Russia, uh, it has a coastline in the Baltic. And this is the one temperate coastline. And of course, you can get in and out of the Baltic, but you have to pass through the belt uh, and the uh, and the, uh, the sound in, in Denmark, uh, between Denmark and Sweden. Then if you go to the east in temperate waters, you have a few uh, harbors, uh, like in uh, south of Kamchatka, the Sea of Zokotsk. And, uh, and these are like Vladivostok, like you have a few access to the sea, but if you look at the at the dimension of Russia, the largest coastline that they have, the longest coastline, is the one along the Arctic Ocean. Right, and it is well north of the Arctic Circle, and this means that it is uh, a uh, a route that uh, can be taken along along that coastline it means that it has to be when the ice is not there or where you have uh where you have icebreaker service and we have we have hinted as uh, at that in previous <coughs> episodes that with the climate change with the uh sea ice in the north receding and becoming weaker that uh this has finally opened up these routes um in an let's say in an economical fashion Yes, and uh, like if you if you think about the global global traffic uh, of uh, goods, we have a big production. Like the biggest producers are is China. The biggest producers are in China. So you have to get things from China over to the rest of the world. And if it is from China to the United States, that's more or less just just crossing the Pacific Ocean. Just crossing mm. the Pacific Ocean in. Uh, in quotes, yes, it's still quite a big ocean. Um, if you uh, want to take things to uh, Europe, which is the other big market, uh, 
you have to uh, pass uh, either south of uh, south of uh, south um, South Africa, like uh, the Cape of Good Hope, or you can pass uh, south of uh, South America. That was Cape Horn, uh, the Cape Horn route. But most ships, the container ships, they pass through the Panama Canal. And here we are talking about uh, 250, 280 uh, million tons that are going uh, through the Panama Canal uh, every year. That's crazy. Now, if you want to transport things for a shorter route, in uh, like miles, sea miles, nautical miles, or kilometer wise, you can take from Shanghai to Rotterdam which are big ports for shipping and receiving things, you can go uh, along the uh, north, the, uh, the Arctic Ocean, uh, and you can do it either through the Northwest Passage or the Northeast Passage. The problem is uh, that uh, they both are partly part of the ice, uh, part of the season is covered with ice, so you have a seasonality in the transport, and uh, like it doesn't look very good uh, for shipping to have a seasonality. You want your goods, your containers to be delivered in good time. Like we have seen when there was this, uh, was the uh, the big container ship that blocked the Suez Canal. <laughs> it blocked the Suez Canal a couple of months who, ago and it blocked who, it for, who could not a, for see a month. that one? Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> exactly, and, uh, and that was a big problem. Like here, for example, in Norway, there were no more electrical bikes to be sold because on the uh, on that ship, there was the, the uh, the furnishing of uh, of uh, the provision of uh, of electrical bikes that were supposed to come to Norway for the whole thing for the for the summer and we didn't get any more. I mean, for those that were waiting for the product, it wasn't very nice. Um, but there are things happening now, and one thing is that the climate is warming. The Arctic is warming, as we said, up to three times faster than the rest of the globe. And this means that the open water season, the season with no ice, is longer than it used to be. That is uh, quite uh, worrying, but it's good for, for the business in this case. And the other is that uh, Russia, and uh, as we mentioned previous, uh, in some of the previous episodes, Russia is also the, uh, has a chairmanship of the Arctic Council now for the next two years, until 2023. Russia has a very big push towards the Arctic and wants to invest in the Arctic. And one of the things they did was to finance the uh, building of icebreakers. So they not only have these big traditional conventional and uh, nuclear icebreakers, but uh, they are building some new ones, including some liquid natural gas propelled icebreaker, which are more environmentally friendly than, than the others. A little bit, and, but they're still they're still um, <laughs> using carbon to propel things. Yeah, yeah. Either that or uh, nuclear powered uh, icebreakers that are, of course, the biggest and the most the powerful because you need the, not only the power in the engine to to push the ice, but you need also the weight. So when the icebreaker goes right uh, and breaks the ice, it just slides, it is pushed by the engine on top of the ice, and then it needs its weight or additional weight by pumping water in the in the tanks to break the ice under it. So so, so it's they, a, so they, a, they a work ship. they work not just with engine power, they use momentum to mm. they use to crash yeah, the ice. They, yeah. Yeah, and, and to come up on top of it. So this is this is one thing that they do. But uh, they have a goal of increasing from about 30 million tons of goods per year past the, the present volume of, uh, of traffic through the Northern Sea Route to 80 million tons per year, which is uh, quite uh, <laughs> quite an increase. Yes, it is. As I said, if you're going from, if you compare to the Panama Canal, we like you are going from one tenth of the traffic of the Panama Canal to one third of the traffic that goes through the Panama Canal supposedly should go up there. And for shipping to be choosing that route, you need to have a, an assurance that it will work. Interesting. So, so I would, I would also see Panama getting nervous here because Panama, the Panama Canal is a big source of income for Panama. So, yes, it is. It's a, it's a. I mean, it is the biggest source of income for, yeah. for, for the state of Panama. But uh, it is. Uh, I mean, I suppose that uh, <clears throat> there are uh, 
not only a question of regularity here that is important, but also a question of politics and of uh, and contracts and, and things. It's not it's not so easy to deviate traffic from one side to the other. At least not as far as I know. I'm not an expert on shipping here, but it's. It looks like you would have to have also a lot of permits. You would have to have like special ships that can pass there. Um, it's not just that you can go up there with a with a normal container ship and just pass through. And it's not just a question of capacity of icebreakers. You also need the pilots because it's uh, usually a piloted passage. So it's. Um, all one, right. One. Uh, one. And uh, just. Uh, just to finish before we go over. That's the other. The other big issue would be emergency uh, operations are there, and uh, if you by any chance have in an accident uh, in these remote areas, it's very difficult to clean up the place. So there is also an environmental profile that, uh, as you mentioned, the CO two production for the ships, but also. Also, the uh, the impact that uh, any accident could have. But that's quite an interesting thing. 2022, 2023. So next winter, not this one here. They uh, there should be a year round navigation through the through the Northern Sea route. And uh, well, let's see if the Panama Canal is uh, losing to the Northern Sea route, or whether this is a increased uh, flow of goods towards Europe. Ah, <sighs> as if we. Didn't have enough stuff already on the shelves. Exactly. Anyway, um, that was item number one. We, by the way, have all the links to all the news articles we're talking about here in our description in the show notes somewhere down below here if you're watching this or just check your podcast player. Yeah, and, um, and, this, and this news uh, came from Arctic Today yes. uh, that I forgot to... So from mention. Arctic today, let's move on to uh, what is the CCAMLR and why is it important? Yeah, the um, <clears throat> the CCAMLR is uh, what we call CAMLRs, which is a Commission on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, and this is uh, a link that we got uh, through uh, Henry uh, as well, and. Uh, CAMELAR is a, a convention um, that uh, um, is actually regulating or giving the advice to the different governments that uh, that are involved in, in Antarctica about what to do with the marine living resources or both the animals and plants in uh, around the Antarctica. So they, they now, are an advisory board <coughs> of sorts to governments? Yeah. Okay. It's an advisory body. Um, what is uh, important is that they are going to be having a meeting uh, at the end of this week. So uh, starting on the 18th uh, until the 29th of October, they have a yearly meeting. And uh, they do several things, including suggesting new protected areas. And this year, there are uh, three large marine protected areas that are suggested. And uh, one is on East Antarctic, MPA, so Marine Protected Area, a Weddell Sea, MPA, and an Antarctic Peninsula, MPA. And if these are voted through, then it would be a big push towards creating the largest uh, ocean protection in ever. And it would be quite good for the planet, I think, as well. Now... This is a campaign for uh, pushing uh, or suggesting to Camelard that they should uh, they should really work towards uh, towards adopting these MPAs, these marine protected areas. There are a few things which are maybe a little bit out of date because they uh, created this um, uh, a few months ago when Angela Merkel was still the Chancellor of Germany. Which uh, isn't right but, now, uh, yes. Yeah. Well, no, she yeah. actually is the new government. She actually, is... techni te technically, she still is, of course, yes. yes. You're right. She is, and the but, new uh, government is being formed as we speak, but that will probably be right. a few weeks out as we record this. It, it might be, yes. It might. Be, she might still be there. <laughs> Let's see for, the, for this. Uh, but uh, anyways, uh, the uh, important thing that you can do here is to, uh, it's a petition, to Camelar and to the uh, actually to the uh, to the leaders of uh, Germany, the U.S. Uh, and uh, Russia, 
the EU and uh, China um, and France actually in there uh, to to accept and to push for these marine protected areas to be established. And, and, and we are and absolutely in favor for this uh, of this. So I would I would say let us suggest to our listeners to go sign that petition. Ah. It is a good thing. Yes. And they are almost up to 250,000 signatures, yeah. which is amazing. It is. And, uh, and I really, like I can't stress it enough, I don't see of any negative thing that could happen out of, of, of this, these marine protected areas being adopted. Yes. Uh, it, there are like fisheries is not a question in these areas. Maybe there will be a better regulation of, of tourism, which is already quite regulated, but an even better regulation of tourism along the peninsula and other places. It's, it's just good things that can happen to this. So I really advocate for signing and this petition for, for this. Link yeah. is in the show notes. Next item on the newsreel uh, comes from Arctic Today again, and it's about corals and sponges in the in the subarctic which interestingly enough so far i had connected corals with like tropical islands and these kind of things so what's going on there isn't it isn't it strange yeah because it's just exactly the same as me at the beginning when i didn't know about these things and even when i was at university studying corals and uh, like uh, the these life forms and sponges you say like these are things that are from the tropics yes because this is you associate corals with the great barrier reef you associate coral with the mediterranean the red color or the black coral but there are many many times of corals and they form reefs you know like the coral reef along the the east of uh, australia what do you associate with a coral reef chris um life habitat for for fish and for other species down there um that's kind of the main thing i the pictures i know the pictures i've seen are fish weaving in and out between different kinds of corals Exactly, Nemo. Finding Nemo and Dory, for example, <laughs> you know, like yes. a shark tail. <laughs> these uh, these things you find that uh, since we like even for small kids, coral reefs are where life is very dense, and there is a lot of biodiversity in coral reefs, and it's the same with the cold water corals. Um, they grow maybe a little bit slower than freshwater coral uh, than uh, warm water corals, be due to the temperature of the water, but also for because corals um, they need uh, uh, some corals need, need sunlight because it's a symbiosis with uh, they are in symbiosis with uh, with algae, um, but uh, but they still create uh, structures that can protect and. Uh, help life f even other uh, like uh, other order of organisms like uh, like fish like vertebrates not just uh, not just sessile uh, uh, or animals that are uh, are connected to the bottom to the sea bottom um, or uh, creepy crawlies uh, <laughs> like uh, crabs or or uh, urchins and, and sea stars so these are extremely important and uh, because people don't dive uh, usually <laughs> there is no and they don't dive that deep because these we're talking about corals that are maybe uh down to uh 50 100 meters 200 meters oh, deep. That deep um yeah they are very quite deep uh they are unknown but they are very important for uh, uh the uh biodiversity and uh this is really nice and it's uh isn't it, isn't it still interesting? Every time I look at these kind of things, I I go back to the notion that we know a lot more about the stars and the galaxy than we know about our own very own oceans. So exactly, yeah. And uh, when we uh, when we talk about uh, about uh, these uh, these ecosystems, we also have to think about one thing, which is called bioprospecting. So looking for things that can be useful for us and uh, in this case it's not things that just are useful for making money but these are possibly new molecules that can be used for example for 
medicinal purposes. Mm, and okay. uh, there is, uh, for example, a, uh, a sponge that I think it's a sponge that uh, could be a, um, a, like a source of uh, cancer treatment, a cancer treatment drug, the Latruncula austini, for example. Uh, you wouldn't, cool. you wouldn't think of that, but this you wouldn't is expect uh, it, a great yeah. push. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. So, so it's very, very important. The stuff that's going on under the sea um, links nicely into the next topic, which is about the Mariano project up in yes, Norway. And, and this is uh, a, a similar a similar project uh, to this one in Antarctica. It was uh, started in uh, 2006 and it's still ongoing. It had uh, a phase up to 2011, the first phase, and then now we are in the second phase. And it's a mapping of the seafloor uh, along the Norwegian coast. And uh, and this is where they found that for the first time that also Norway has corals. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic project because it actually, it, um, it uses an, a, a very sophisticated and large ROV, so an underwater uh, vehicle that is unmanned and is tethered to the ship. And here you see, for example, a, a location of the, uh, of, of the coral reefs along the Lofoten Islands, for example, just out of the Lofoten. Um, and they fly, I would say, this uh, ROV over the sea bottom. They film what is going on down there. They, of course, have data on what's happening, like the physical parameters, how deep are they, what's the temperature of the water, what kind of uh, oxygen content and turbidity uh, for the visibility. But they also take a film. And uh, it's a fantastic student job to do that. It, uh, in the long run, is probably quite <laughs> it can be quite boring. Um, but... Uh, but sometimes you see fantastic things, and you, as a student, you, uh, a student uh, employed into this Mariano project, you are actually watching the video of what's happening, and you are categorizing what you are seeing. Oh, so they have not, they don't have a way for now to automate that. So they have to manually make little yeah. marks in a, in a table somewhere. Yes, it's it's still. I feel at least you ha you can have a, an, a, a like a a supervised classification of what you see so you can uh, you can see the uh that I mean when there is a fish oops. that the uh, oops this and there is an advertisement there for some belt you can see that there is a okay. that there is a, like a squid in this case and uh, maybe the uh, algorithm uh can tell you that it is a squid the uh important uh, thing is that it has to be confirmed by a human yes so this for example that we are seeing it's out of the Lofoten Moskenes at 650 meter and uh, it's in the uh, it's in the continental slope and it's a fantastic little uh, squid with it's not so little it's a gonatus fabrici which comes up to a uh, like half a meter the mantle oh, so the the head wow. of the squill it's about half a meter it's a very good prey for uh, for for example sperm whales or beaked whales uh, or bottlenose whales i mean it's a uh, it's at uh, the basis, it's one of the key species in the ecosystem up here in the North Atlantic. And you do it with underwater drones. And you do it with an underwater drone that can also stop, like in this case, you can also stop and see if there is something particularly important uh, and interesting you can do that. And of course, it's a, it's a long-term project because it needs to film the sea bottom and Norway as a large, a long coral. <laughs> this is a Trump's a a large Trump's coastline. coral reef. Yes, it's a coral reef out of Tromsø. You see a little, uh, a little fish that could be yeah. uh, the local Nemo, and you see uh, you see all sorts of. I mean, if you you see a shrimp here on the right on the coral, yeah, uh, and uh, some acidia, uh, sea squirts, uh, pycnogonidae there, a uh, a ling. This is uh, one kind of a, uh, I'd say codfish, all sorts close of to a conger eel, yeah. all sorts of corals. This is a brittle star. This is wrestling. The Arctic is wrestling and bustling with life. Yeah, sure. So, like in this case, with the, this site that I put up here, you have a wealth of videos that you can watch and dive along the coast of Norway. 
<laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and you can and you can see what's uh, what's down there. So it's it's really uh, it's really fantastic. Oh, and it may right. give you a, also a, an idea of why it's important to limit the bottom trawling, which destroys the coral reef, and uh, and also to be very careful with anything that has to do with underwater prospecting for minerals or or uh, even going and drilling for oil or other other underwater resources under the seabed resources. All right, from the Undersea Live to ice, we are looking at a video of the British Antarctic Survey about, yeah, about what? About a glacier. Yes, and not just any glacier. We, I think we, we mentioned this before. It's a, a Thwaites Glacier. Yes. It's in the west of Antarctica, so the part of Antarctica just uh, uh, after the uh, uh, um, Antarctic Peninsula. And uh, it's... Uh, a place where the ice can be as thick as three kilometers and the Thwaites Glacier is just huge. Now the uh, <clears throat> it's yeah the, here in the video we can see that it's uh, just as big as uh, England or Flor <laughs> uh, or the the main island of the British Isles and the, wild. and the um, or the state of Florida and uh, uh, it has uh, recently uh, been moving strangely and especially important is understanding why the uh, uh, glacier is moving um, and is carving a lot and is moving. So it is more active um, than it was before. It is more active than it was before. Now the uh, the glacier originates on uh, is is touching the uh, the the bottom. So it's not a floating glacier, not the total uh, floating glacier. Just the front is floating, but as uh, the water is uh, warmer than it tend, tended to be, the warm water is eroding the glacier from underneath. So the, the, uh, there is kind of a cave form between the glacier and the sea bottom. On, on the water side. On the, on the water side, on the ocean side. Yeah. And, and this means that uh, the... Uh, upper part so the floating part of the glacier is getting thinner and more brittle which can carve big bigger uh bigger icebergs like the ones that we have uh, mentioned in the uh, in some of the pre previous episodes but the other thing is that by uh removing this friction between the glacier and the bottom what might happen can you guess well it 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 there's more weight on the top, so it starts to um, it starts to crack up, I guess. Yeah, crack up. This is one thing there, and the other thing is that you are actually creating less friction between the bottom, right? The the rock bottom and the glacier, and the glacier actually can go very fast, much faster than before. And uh, and if this happens in a let's say a catastrophic uh movement of the glacier you can have actually the emptying of the glacier like flushing of the glacier into the uh into the ocean because it's and, not it's uh, not pushing yeah. anymore against it so the rest can kind of speed up and and get into the yeah. water faster yeah exactly so think about uh, uh three kilometers of ice or something like that that is uh, covering a surface that is about the size of florida or or uh, or England and Scotland together, and, and which behaves and, and like a liquid, right? So yeah, which was which was on land, and it yes. goes into the uh, into the ocean. Well, that is a lot of water, a lot of volume that is added to the ocean, which means uh, a uh, quite a quick uh, raise of the uh, of the sea level. And I like how the video the video does a good job visualizing what is happening yeah. here and how the grounding line is uh, is moving mm -hmm. back to to uh, well towards yeah, the this land. Is, yes. And this is a uh, this is a video that is uh, made or produced by the British Antarctic Survey and it's uh, very well made and very scientifically uh, correct. And uh, I think I encourage even those that are following us uh, just on the audio podcast to check the notes and to uh and to watch this video if anything it is uh, clearly a, a, a visual that will stay in your mind for sure yeah yes 
Exactly. Okay, we are going back to Arctic Today, which is, which is one of our favorite news sources here. Um, and this one is about polar bears. What is going on here? Yeah, and uh, Arctic Today is one of the sources here, but it's uh, a report on a uh, survey uh, that is... Uh, actually a, a scientific paper based on a scientific paper it's a popularization right. of a scientific paper and uh, it is about uh, a study on uh, how many polar bears survive and uh, it's uh, made uh, it's published uh, it's a scientific study published on ecology and evolution a study by by jeffrey bromagan uh, and colleagues uh, from the uh, United States uh, Geological Survey, because these are the uh, this is the agency that is uh, uh, looking at marine mammals in Alaska. Strangely enough, it's the U.S. Geological Survey uh, that has uh, the jurisdiction about walrus and polar bears out there, and the task to study these. So what they did is that they looked at the north coast of Alaska, the one that is uh, on the Beaufort Sea. Mm -hmm. So not the one that we saw before, which was the sub the uh, the subarctic uh, in the on the Gulf of Alaska, so the south of Alaska. This is the north of Alaska, and uh, polar bear uh, scientists they fly out every year if uh, they can, and they look for polar bears in the early uh, early spring. So when the polar bears come out of the den, uh, the mothers with their calves, and uh, where it's uh, the ice is still quite good and uh, they uh, uh, tag the polar bears so they anesthetize the polar bear from a helicopter they land beside the polar bear they take measures and they either read the tag that was put on the polar bear like an ear mark like a cattle tag similar like slightly smaller on the ear of the polar bear or a tattoo in the gum like uh, one might do to a dog and uh, either they control which polar bear they have taken because they've seen it before or they tag the polar bear again which means that at the end they go out and they maybe take a, an x number of polar bears and a certain number of them are uh, marked and a certain number are unmarked now if you consider this and i think that was one of the first episodes that i did in the very beginning about, about how to count yes about how to count whales i mean and this is how to count polar bears but it's similar and this is one of the basic ways of counting animals is the mark recapture technique so if over a period of time you mark a certain number of animals so you have a quantity of animals a number of animals that are marked and they are released in the population, and you assume that the population actually mixes together, then you take a small sample of this population. So the small sample will include some marked and some unmarked animals. And if you make a little simple relationship, the relationship between the marked animal that you caught with the total population of the marked animals is similar to the relationship between the unmarked animal that you caught and mm -hmm. the total population x so let's say i make some let's make some numbers let's say we we marked 20 polar bears okay yep then we go out the popular polar bears they mix or the marked polar bears they mix in the total population and then we go out sometime later and we capture some polar bears and we find 10 polar bears so we have 10 polar bears out of 20 but if we let's say found uh, captured 30 polar bears so 20 polar bears like 10 polar bears are to 20 as of course it's it's a 20 are to 
X. It's a, a pretty much a statistical exercise that you're doing there. You don't count everyone. You count a, a certain amount, and then you can put that in relation with the actual ones out there. Yes. And you are fairly close, usually. So you are sure you're very close. So you would have a polar bear population that is double yes. the number of unmarked that you have. So if you have 20 unmarked polar bears, then you would have 40. Right. The population would be 40 in total. And you can do this with this. So... Just to go a little bit uh, more towards <laughs> the popular side, this was heavy science, maybe. Um, <laughs> well, the, but, uh, but every, every, I know, I know, we have we have a, an audience here who are deep <laughs> yes. in the trenches, anyway. Um, um, exactly. So yeah. So, but yeah, if you want to know more about this, go back to our episode number. Let me mm, see. I put it? it here. How eight. Count whales. Episode eight, yes, eight um, where the two of us discussed that in terms of whales yeah. which which i think counting whales is probably harder than counting polar, polar bears because whales whales live in three dimensions uh under the sea yeah. and polar, well, polar bears swim as well yeah but polar bears uh, yeah they have other other challenges but anyway so the important <laughs> part in this study was not how to count polar bears because this is really something but the results that they got out of this uh, this population estimates, so they started doing this uh, this system in the early two thousands, and uh, and they uh, actually see that the polar bear population has a stepwise reduction. So, it was at one higher level at the beginning, then it had a reduction over a couple of years to a lower number, and then more or less it kept stable for five six years and then it went down again so this is what they mean by that it has a it's like a, a stair uh, a stair step pattern uh, reduction of the population mm -hmm. and this was is very puzzling and one of the because usually if you say well there there are fewer and fewer polar bears they would uh, just uh, constantly decline it would not be a step Yes. If you use the same method and the same efforts for counting them from year to year. So have so they found out why there? that is? No, they no. haven't found out exactly why that is, but they also actually have a few hypotheses that can be tested here. And one of them could be that uh, by uh, removing some of the older and weaker polar bears, the younger polar bears can actually have more success. So for a certain period of time, you will have uh, more um, calf production, for example, cub production, like the, the, the young, the youngsters yes. would be more, they would be more reproductive success. Um, this could be one of the things. Uh, the other is that uh, for a, like if you remove some of the some of the uh, older or some of the polar bears, eh, then the ones that are left, they have more food. So uh, there's, there's, and, there's less uh, competition keep, about food sources, for example. Yeah, so in the sh medium term, they could be having a better survival chance for at least these four or five years. But, uh, but it's very difficult to see why. It's just... Uh, important though that uh, there are fewer and fewer polar bears in this part of the world and uh, it's not well known why and uh, it's not known uh, whether this is because of a migration northwards we were talking about the reduction of sea ice we're talking about the um, oil um, the oil extraction oil and gas extraction north of uh, Alaska in the in the slope or the continental shelf north of Alaska. Uh, there are removals of polar bears because of interactions with these uh, installations, with these uh, oil extraction and gas extraction areas. Um, it is, uh, there is some hunting, of course, by the, uh, by the, um, by the local Inuit. Uh, but this is uh, about yeah, less than a hundred animals a year, so it shouldn't be uh, it shouldn't be uh, it should be like uh, like that. But uh, two thirds of these uh, are males, usually, and that is of course it can be it can be uh, one of the explanations. You remove the males from the population, but the ones that remain, they can still reproduce because one male can cover several females. So, anyways, interesting. All, All right. Bears, but uh, 
sad that there are fewer and fewer polar bears. Right. So we have uh, the next item is a bit of a time critical thing because it is about the Arctic e talks that take place on Thursday, the 21st of October of this year. So um, here's a tweet by yes. Troy Buffard. He is the, let me check, the director of the Center of Arctic Security and Resilience at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And he, yes. uh, he mentions the Arctic e-talks. What are the Arctic e-talks? The Arctic e-talks that are, in this case, it's uh, they are happening on Thursday next week, um, are uh, a, a presentation of, uh, uh, let's say, the, in this case, the politics, uh, policy, and uh, strategy uh, about the Arctic from uh, uh, a few entities that are mostly related to NATO. Um, you uh, can see that uh, that the uh, the partners in the e talks are uh, defense uh, um, laboratories or the Ministry of Defense. Uh, there is a NATO, of course, uh, the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, uh, Royal Danish Defense College, and United States called Coast Guard. So they are mostly related to um, the government, to, uh, the government, and related to the armed forces, uh, but they. Uh, but and or maybe <laughs> they are about uh, how stable the situation is or how unstable the situation is in the Arctic, and in this case they uh, have invited the uh, um, ambassador, the EU ambassador to uh, the Arctic, so the European Union ambassador for the Arctic, uh, um, Mr. Michael Mann. And uh, he will present the new Arctic strategy of the European Union. So if you are interested in hearing what from the source on what is the EU Arctic policy and having somebody telling you about what the text is actually saying, <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe even more important, listening to the question and answer session afterwards, Please tune in. Uh, you have to uh, register uh, for this webinar, but it's a very simple registration. You don't need to pay anything or or uh, put any other things at your name and uh, an address and email address. And it's going to be a, a Zoom meeting, a Zoom webinar, and you can hear Ambassador Michael Mann talking about the European Union and the Arctic. And uh, should this be too late, then there is, um, I think they put them online after the fact. So um, this, is an, this is an ongoing series. They do this monthly. And as it looks, you will be able to still go back to the yeah. talk. After it has happened, and there are like uh, there are it's uh, it's something that started only at the beginning of uh, this year, so yeah. uh, we are going back to uh, just uh, the uh, January uh, 2021. Uh, but uh, there are a few really interesting recorded talks in here, including uh, the uh, uh, conversation with uh, the Iceland's senior Arctic official, so the representative of Ice for Iceland to the Arctic Council, for example. Yeah. Very cool. So, great resource. We go on to the next item, which is about uh, people drilling, well, not holes in ice, but drilling cores out of ice. This yes. is in, the, in, in nature. Yeah. And uh, this is something that I put because uh, we have uh, usually the idea that uh, um, pollution is something that comes with the um, humans becoming industrialized. So we're talking about uh, the uh, like late, late 19th century or middle of the 19th century uh, increase in the use of uh, coal. And one of the production of uh, one one of the pollutants that we find are black carbon particles. So the soot that is coming out of the burning of fossil fuels, and this is transported. It's very fine particulate. It's transported up to the polar areas, and it uh, falls on the snow 
or the ice uh, on top of the glaciers and it's then preserved the action of black carbon is that it's since it's black it decreases the albedo do you remember what the albedo is that's the the reflectivity of exactly the surface. well done uh, thank you mr the, teacher <laughs> exactly so the reflectivity <laughs> of the glacier is reduced and when the reflectivity is reduced there is a consequence and can you remember what the consequence is well it gets warmer Exactly, and so it melts faster. Yes. That's really good. Um, so this is something that we associate with the burning of coal and then with the burning of uh, oil. But these, uh, these scientists, they have gone uh, and uh, taken some, uh, some samples of the dep depositions in Antarctica, and mm. they can see that there has been deposition of black carbon that is corresponding quite well to the uh, arrival of Maoris to New Zealand and for the burning of charcoal, for the burning of, uh, of, of the vegetation by the Maoris in New Zealand, which was in the 13th and 14th century. So we are talking about 700 years ago not just a couple of hundred years ago and uh, this is very interesting that even let's say a small population of humans settling and burning a relatively limited uh, number of uh, trees can have an influence on the albedo of antarctica and uh and this uh, study okay. here in Nature, um, you can read the abstract and then they want to, to pay for it. But it yeah, is they want to pay you for it. Um, of course, uh, there are uh, popular versions. You can, you can try to uh, hunt down. Google and, and hunt down the, uh, the articles, more popular articles. The BBC had uh, a piece on this and The Guardian, for example. They are quite, quite nice uh, uh, explanations of this. Okay. Yes. So we have ice to go back in the past uh, and, and see what's going on or what was going on. Um, this other one, that came across my news feed as well. And uh, this is an interesting one. There's also air that can give us hints what was going on. And of course, there's air enclosed in, in, in bubbles, in glaciers, for example. But then here's a completely different one. What is this about? This is an article in The Guardian. Well, it's it's not too far away from what you were saying, Chris. Um, now, uh, an artist uh, called uh, Wayne Binaiti, I think is pronunciation of his uh, of his uh, of his name. Um, he has had a collaboration with the British Antarctic Survey, and uh, he is making uh, this exhibit in Glasgow in occasion of the COP26 uh, climate conference. We'll talk about a little later as the last item today. And uh, he, one of the exhibits that he has is one of the items that he has is a glass sculpture that contains the air from an ice core. Oh, so they have extra he has extracted the ice. Okay, he yes. has, he's extracted the air from this old ice core. Or that goes that far yes. and, and put it in a in a piece of art in a capsule. And this is linked to what we are talking about before, uh, because this air should be because uh, the scientists from the British Antarctic Survey can go down and, and say, yeah, this is from that period. It should be from the year seventeen sixty five. And why that year? <laughs> It's because that is the last air before the big explosion in burning of coal, before the Industrial Revolution takes Which the, uh, the first steps. Which everything. Yeah. Yes. So they say this is the uh, pre-industrial air. This is the cleanest, the last clean air that we have had and on just, this planet. Just imagine that's a capsule. If you open that, take one deep breath, it's gone. <laughs> 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 exactly but uh yeah and this is uh this is of course uh 
This is, of course, uh, like symbolic uh, because, as we have seen in the article before, there was already an influence and, a, let's say, pollution uh, from humans in Antarctica, even in Antarctica. But this is really like uh, uh, like highlighting that it's like it's it's not long ago we had clean air. 1765 and then we started with this industrial revolution which of course uh, like we are basing our most of the uh, most of human life on the planet on uh, at the moment and uh, that has had uh, an influence in what in the quality in the organoelectric properties of the air we breathe and i like that they uh, that they are using an approach through art to this because it really kind of brings it home um, at least to me yes there's a more, more direct link than to some of the some of the convoluted studies that are hard to read yes and uh, and actually it's not a new thing to bring art into and science together in yeah. polar uh, research we have had uh, the danes uh, with milius Eriksson, and this is going to be something that uh, henry and i had uh, planned on talking about with the literary expedition mm -hmm. uh, up to north uh, to the uh, northeast greenland and uh, and even uh, soon actually there is going to be in 2023 i was contacted by the swedish uh, polar secretariat about an expedition that is going to be called the art of melt so mm -hmm. with the icebreaker odin going into the ice and and having an an art component in wow. glaciology um, so d i remember okay so this this kind of uh, science i think in the future might be uh, easier because um i just remember seeing somewhere in a mountainous area they were just as a novelty gag gift selling cans of air so if those cans survive for a few hundred years you will have plenty of uh, research air yes, from exactly. the 2000s so <laughs> yeah exactly no all right um two more items on the list you okay the next one i think might be might be near and dear to your own heart because it's about walrus yeah. <laughs> and uh, yes. we have established that you that you like them that mm. you did uh, that you did study them quite thoroughly and it's yes. also something that is near and dear to my heart and that is citizen science yeah exactly so um, this is something quite new and uh, uh, you find it in several sources. Uh, uh, this is uh, from the uh, WWF, uh, because WWF is one of the main uh, sponsors here. It's uh, something you uh, that was in the news uh, in the, on the BBC, on the Guardian uh, as well. Uh, I revealed that I receive a lot of feeds from these two sources. Um, and it is sponsored also by the Postcode Lottery. It's a U UK um, initiative. And uh, you can read more about uh, who sponsors this. But this is also a way for the WWF to sponsor uh, research. And this is research by the British Antarctic Survey. And I remind you that even though they are Antarctic, they also work in the Arctic, where the walruses are. and. Uh, the uh, citizen science part of it is that if you register, you will go through a, uh, a training, uh, like a brief uh, session of training in recognizing walruses and in counting walruses on pictures taken from a satellite. And, uh, and then you will get to go and have a try and help science by analyzing and the, the, the pictures that uh, are suggested for you and where you have to count how many walruses you have on. I like this. Well, and the title, <laughs> Walrus from Space. It's perfect. And it is like this because the, the, uh, the interesting part is that, I mean, if there are many interesting parts here, but the uh, technology the satellite technology now that is available for the public, we're not talking about military satellites, we're not talking about like really the state of the art satellite, but we are talking about commercial satellites. Commercial they satellites with cameras, with pretty good cameras on board. They have pretty good cameras. So an A4 page, so like 
not a very big page is the resolution that you can have. And this is much smaller than a walrus. So, so you they, can they cannot, see they the cannot contours read, of the walrus. They cannot read the text on an A4 page, but they can identify an A4 page in size. Okay. <laughs> they can identify the uh, the A4 page as one of the pixels of the, of the image of the sensor. And uh, this means that you can actually delineate walruses and and there are also studies of feasibility on how to do this for, for whales that come into the surface. And of course, you need a clear atmosphere and everything. But, uh, but it is important to look at these things and to help because they think that they need about half a million citizen scientists for uh, the next five years to cover this because the Arctic is very large. Uh, walruses tend to haul out on the ice if it's there, but they also come out on beaches. And walruses, as you remember from our tours, Chris, they are pretty similar in color to the sand. Of They're the not that easy to see, out. yes. Yes. So um, this is fantastic. It's about uh, helping scientists arrive at an estimate of the number of walruses and of the distribution of the walruses uh, in the uh, circumpolar, in the circumarctic region. And, um, and to have fun, because it's actually quite fun to look at the animals. I mean, they are really, really fun. Animals. It is, it is uh, interesting. So, so what, they, what they want you to do is, um, well, help them identify. So you sign up, you create an account, of course, and then you, uh, you spend about half an hour on a bigger screen. Your smartphone screen might be a bit too small for that, but if you have a proper computer or a tablet, then um, that's all they're asking for. Do, do they give you medals? Do you get something back? I don't know. I haven't gotten so far because this started yesterday and I was in a meeting. Oh, so it's I so had new. Okay. A chance of, okay. of starting. Yeah, I think it was yesterday or the day before. But uh, uh, I haven't uh, yet registered, but this is the next thing that I'll do and I'll try to enroll my children here. It's Very something cool. that is uh, uh, sponsored also by the, uh, by the Scouts. And uh, it is uh, possible, and actually probably kids are even better than adults at doing this. And it's a good alternative to just playing video games. It is a video game. A very worth it. It is a video it is game. A, it is a kind of a video game. And of course, like you are not the only one going to be checking that picture so you will having you will be checking a picture or several pictures you will count the walruses yeah. on give a guess on or like your guesstimate of uh, how many animals you have in that picture other people are going to do the same and if there is an agreement yeah. among the different counters then it's going to be having a high level of confidence and it's going to be not exactly the first one that is going to be checked if there is a big disagreement, then then the picture is going to be checked by by some others. But it's going to be helping the scientists reduce their number of hours that they have to spend themselves in doing this, because you can get really like a, I call it observer fatigue, like yep. when you are counting a lot of animals and <laughs> on these pictures and, then you, and you, you can, can pat yourself on the shoulder for having done a really good thing here yes so really, really good. last but not least we are going to uh well it's a conference isn't it Yes, it's the conference of the parties uh, and uh, it's a United Nations Climate Change Conference for 2021, which the conference of the party is uh, uh, the number 26 in oh, the line. And it says it's in partnership with Italy. Bella yes. Italia. Uh, uh, Yes, if you um, if you think about the agreement uh, uh, for the um, how do you call it for the uh, climate this uh, uh, this uh, agreement where we have the uh, the limiting of the, the Paris Accord the Paris Agreement yes that was COP twenty one so now we are in COP twenty six and uh, some people would say that that is. Um, that is the the moment where we can do something, really. Like, if it's not the last time we can really do something great for the 
for the uh, for the climate, for the planet, for ourselves, it's pretty close. And uh, when you say in partnership with Italy, is because the main COP is uh, now from the 31st of October to the 12th of November in Glasgow, so in Scotland. Okay. Uh, the UK would like to say it UK. Uh, the Scottish government probably will say it's in Scotland, um, but it's United Kingdom. And uh, the uh, there has been a pre-meeting uh, from the 30th of September to the 2nd of October that uh, took together um, climate and energy ministers uh, and uh, for a pre-COP uh, talks because there are going to be very many things happening up there. It's like a world fair. Um, there is everybody from heads of state to normal citizens that are going to be around this COP. And uh, there are going to be scientists as well. So there are going to be pavilions with uh, different uh, themes. Like there is going to be a cryosphere pavilion, for example, where the, uh, well, we, like the place where I work, like AMAP is going to be represented and we're going to be representing our products and uh, uh, our scientific results. But it's uh, very important uh, that uh, the ministers actually negotiate and come to an agreement of what to do. This is something that has happened in Paris uh, with a goal, the uh, limiting of the warming of the climate by uh, 20, what was it, 2030. Um, uh, now we need to go further, like to make, uh, to have a status on where we are. And this is the United Nations uh, the Intergovernmental Panel of uh, on Climate Change has presented the first part uh, of the um, of their report uh, a few few weeks ago. So there is a physical basis understanding of what's happening and what will happen. A much better understanding than there was in Paris. And uh, and now the ministers will have to say, what do we do? So, and uh, given the meeting in Italy was uh, giving a little bit uh, head start, so that uh, people that will then come to the Glasgow meetings have already had some pre-negotiations, and everyone they has a head start, pretty we're. much. Yes. So, I think, well, Paris, Paris was the one thing, but as we see, it has still taken a long time for everyone to come around and with all that's happened in the political sphere over let's say the last couple of years i think cop 26 is probably the most important event right now yes and uh, and it is important to uh, to see that i mean there are some pretty pretty good goals i mean the, the uh, web page is is quite uh, is quite well made uh, there are four goals one is to secure global net zero emissions by mid-century mm -hmm. and keep 1.5 degrees and this is <clears throat> the uh, the 2030 um, uh, emission criteria that uh, was uh, negotiated already in paris but then it's uh, the second goal is to adapt to protect communities and natural habitats which is, of course, very important because we have to restore, protect and restore ecosystems and also build defenses that defend the ecosystem, not just uh, the uh, defenses for like weapons, and not just defenses for populated areas, but also to protect ecosystems that uh, could be also, of course, agricultural areas. Then there is going to be a, a financial aspect, like how to mobilize finance because there are, as a goal, there is a, a need for at least $100 billion a year in climate finance. At uh, least, yes. Yes, yes. And, and that was a, a, like a, a delivery that was already negotiated before, but it's not, uh, it's not happened. Like countries have to have to pay this, and uh, and the international financial institutions they also have to play their part in unleashing these uh, trillions of both private and public sector finance. And then there is something about collaboration. So we have to work together to deliver these 
things that were basically written down in Paris. So there is a, in Paris, uh, there was a rule book that was uh, initiated and it has to be finalized. So what are the operational aspects of the Paris Agreement? Like how do how do you implement the Paris Agreement? What kind of rules do you have? Like, for example, if you say Germany has to reduce their emissions by that date, and if they do not reduce it of that amount or not by that date, what are the penalties, for example? And if you do it before, can you actually, I would say, sell or transfer your advantage the advantage that you had to another part like the negotiation of the carbon quotas that was one of the things that was it's very it's very controversial like if one nation reduces the carbon emissions can and reduces more than than they had promised to do can they sell their carbon quotas for example to another country so cop 26 from the 31st of october to the 12th of november um it's definitely an important one to watch and um, there will be more on this little podcast about it for sure definitely. there will surely be yes all right that brings us to the end of this episode wow that was a short newsreel only one hour and ten minutes <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we indulge a little bit here. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for your time. I think I will probably go and start putting air in cans now and uh, help science in the future. Citizen science for the future. How about that? That's, that's my takeaway. We need more air. It is. <laughs> Different air from here, from there, from the fields, back door. Yes. And so on. Anyway, thanks everyone for being here. This is Curiously Polar. We are online at curiouslypolar.com and um, until next time bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.